Okay, perfect. So hello everyone. I hope you all are doing amazing. My name is Siva Janur. I'm a fourth year medical student. And inshallah for the next hour or so we'll be discussing the patterns of inheritance. I think this is one of the few PAL genetics uh, review sessions. So uh, don't worry about it. My aim over here is to get your attention for just a few minutes inshallah or like a good amount of time. And then I want you to get out of this lecture understanding everything about this, okay? I will be covering the first part, which is the patterns of inheritance. And then Maryam Mutayib is gonna come and pick up the second part of this uh, lecture, which is the variations of inheritance. Both topics are really important topics and are considered high yield for your exam. So keeping that in mind, uh, let's get started. But let's talk about the patterns in inheritance in general first. So from your understanding, um, please tell me what you do you understand from this title? What do we exactly mean by the patterns of inheritance? Uh, all of you are allowed to unmute your mics and uh, speak if you would like to contribute or you can type it down on the chat. So I just want to get you to start thinking a bit, start brainstorming. What do you mean by patterns of inheritance? Uh, I think it's like uh, how each individual has its uh, his own like uh, specific like uh, blue eyes. My my brother has brown brown eyes or black hair, something like that. Okay, and that that's a good thought. That's a good thought. So what you're trying to say, how that if we have a specific feature that is common um, in the parents, then we would expect something like it in the um, siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why is it? Why do you think that it's like a whole lecture or a thing to study the patterns of inheritance? I think to uh -huh. know the percentage. Of which, uh, like, how, how, what would I get? Like, brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, and uh, like the percentage, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay, that's one thing. But in other words, we would want to use it with more, um, of course, like knowing the percentage of how often would I get, for example, a sun with blue eyes or a brown eyes or whatever. But we also keep in mind that we need this and we feel that it's very important because we want to know the patterns of inheritance of diseases. So, for example, if I have, I'm carrying the mutation of a gene that leads to a disease, then what's the chance of me having a son or a daughter with that specific disease. We want to study the patterns and study the percentages, okay? So uh, for that, we will start from the basics of those diseases, okay? Let's start with the slides. So we have different modes of inheritance, okay? And for this slide, we'll start with the just definitions, okay? So one thing when it comes to medical words or medical terminology, always there are prefixes and suffixes. You always have to look at those and it will always give you a good portion of the meaning or the definition of the terminology immediately, okay? So one example of this is a monogenic mode of inheritance mean that the phenotype is due to a single gene defect. Another name for this is Mendelian, and this is the most important one that we're going to be talking about. Because what I want you to get is that mono indicates one. So you keep this in mind and and define the rest of the terminology, even if this is the first time you look at this kind of thing, okay? The next kind of mode of inheritance is oligogenic, and oligo just means a few. So again, phenotypes that are due to defects in a few genes, okay? And then the next one we have is polygenic, which is due to many defects, many gene defects. And then the last one is multifactorial phenotype, that is due to genetic defect and, and environmental uh, factors. So multifactorial, it involves two factors, one of which is genetic and another one is environmental, okay? Now, why are we discussing this in general? We talk about the modes of inheritance because we are over here only addressing monogenic diseases. And this, yeah, when it comes to the others, then no, we don't use like a pedigree or any of the patterns or table that, tables that we're gonna discuss for the other modes of inheritance. We're only talking about the monogenic type, okay? 
Moving on, there is monogenic disorders, of course. And what do we mean by that? It means a disorder that is determined by an allele at a single locus. Okay, what does this mean? Disorder, or you can think a disease, or you can even think a mutation. Something went wrong over here, okay? And it determined, that is determined by an allele. What's an allele? Do you have, do you guys have a good understanding of what an allele is? Okay, no worries. An allele in, in simple, simple words is basically a variant of DNA, a variant of, an, of DNA strand in our case right now, okay? Or a variant of a gene. An allele just means a variant of something, okay? In a single locus, locus is a location. So a disorder that is determined by a variant of DNA or an allele in a single locus, in a single location. Okay, remember it's also monogenic. So one single gene, okay? So what are examples of monogenic disorders? One of which that you guys might have heard about is sickle cell uh, anemia or sickle cell disease, okay? And this is a mutation in the gene that forms the hemoglobin cells, okay? Or the hemoglobin molecules, okay? That later on form red blood cells, okay? And just this single gene mutation leads to a whole disease, okay? Another one is Marfan syndrome. And I'm sure you guys came across it. You don't really have to uh, memorize the um, syndromes because you're not really asked about them in genetics in specific, but it's good to know them as those come often when it, uh, in like uh, different kind of blocks in uh, medicine in general, okay? Okay, okay yeah, we talked about the examples, sickle cell anemia and Marfan syndrome. Okay, now how do we study those patterns? How can we know the probability of this disease or defect to come in offspring, okay? We use what we call a pedigree, okay? Or this graph, okay, yep. Yeah? We're gonna dissect everything about this graph. We're gonna talk about every shape and what it means, every pattern and of inheritance and what it could mean, okay? So for now, for the next uh, couple of slides, I will be sharing with you guys a shape and I would want you guys to uh, either type it out or say what you think it is, and then uh, we'll be moving on this way, okay? So I'm not gonna show you the answer immediately. I need you guys to think about it first, and then we'll discuss if your answers are correct or not, okay? So it's going to be more of question answer based, okay? And it's pretty fun, to be honest. This is my favorite part of genetics between me and you guys. So looking at this kind of shape, what do you think it indicates? So when you see a box male. in a pedigree, it means a male. Male, it, male. Exactly, it means a male. And when you see a circle, it's a female. female. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So a way that I remember this is that generally, generally speaking, men have to ha generally have sharper features. That's why we gave them bo the box with more pointy edges, right? But females, no, have smoother features. That's why we gave them the circle. Stupid way, because it sticks. Believe me, this is how I memorized it since first year. Okay? Next. What do you think this means, or what does it indicate? So the numbers inside the circle or a square means the number of participants, okay? Or like the number of males and females. Okay, so for example, if you see this, I'm talking about three males. And if you see this, I'm talking about four females. Okay, moving on. A black square or like a shaded object. Exactly. It means that this person is affected with whatever we're talking about. Disease, mutation, most likely in our cases, at least it's gonna be a disease, okay? It's an affected male. And if it was the same thing, this is circle, okay, yeah. it's an affected theme. Yes. So the next one. A carrier. A carrier, exactly. And since it's a circle, 
it's a female. So remember, completely shaded, female, yeah. it's a completely affected individual. Partially shaded, just a carrier, meaning they have one normal allele and one normal variant and one affected variant, okay? So some of the circle is normal and some of it isn't, okay? So this is a carrier. Uh, next, when we have an arrow pointing towards the... This is what we call a proband, okay? So what do we mean by a proband, okay? It means that this is the individual that is our patient, or for example, that we're concerned about. So for example, let's say you're looking at a pedigree, so yeah, but you don't know which one are we concerned about. There are like a huge pedigree with three generations. Okay, who is our patient? Who is the person that we're studying their case or worried about or investigating their case or whatever? This error just indicates it like, oh, this person came to my clinic and I did the pedigree to his family. Do you get what I mean? We're dealing with this individual, okay? So again, a proband. Next. Yes, exactly. This indicates a diseased uh, male, okay? So they passed away. So what does the number below mean? This one. Mm, not 10 months ago, but it's a good guess. It indicates the age at which the individual passed away. So this passed away at 10 months old, okay? So according to this, this is trying to say that this is an infant that passed away at 10 months old. Okay. Next, we have, oh, a triangle. This one is new. This one indicates a miscarriage. Okay. So it's neither a circle nor a square, not a male, not a female. If you want to think of something in between, it's a triangle and it indicates that uh, this person, or like this, is a miscarriage, okay? Clear? So remember, triangle, miscarriage. Moving on. If we have a fully, a full line, not a dotted line, a solid line between a male and a female, then this indicates that they are? Married. Exactly. They are married. This one's pretty simple. But what if we have a dash in between? They are? Divorced. Divorced. Divorced, exactly. See, simple stuff, you know? But uh, a double uh, solid two. line. Married to two. Again? He, he, married, he, he has two wives. Uh, uh, <laughs> good guess was no. <laughs> because in that case, they would put a solid line over here, like, there's gonna be a solid line with a female over here and another one, let's say like over here, another circle over here. This means that they're married to two. But that's not the case. A double dotted line is married to family or in other words, and the terminology for this is uh, consanguinity, okay? And this is a word that you're gonna come across a lot in like peds rotation and stuff like that, okay? In general, also in genetics, because this is very important. We will talk later on about why consanguinity or marriage within a family is actually actually um, relates and contributes to the patterns of inheritance, okay? But in general, consanguinity means marriage between the first or second cousin or that they're from the same family, okay? So one solid line is married, two solid lines married to a family member, okay? Or part of someone who's part of the family. Okay, what about this, uh, rhombus and the P? A miscarriage void. <laughs> Good guess, but no. This, exactly, this indicates pregnancy, okay? So if a miscarriage was a, uh, a triangle, okay, a triangle, a full pregnancy that's still viable is a 
uh, two triangles opposite to each other, or like a rhombus, if you want to think about it this way, okay? And P for pregnancy. So yeah, moving on. Okay, things are starting to get a bit complicated. What is this? Let's say I have a female over here, okay? Actually, let me make it like a bit uh, more, like I'll give you guys a hint, okay? So I have a female here and a male here. And they got this. Okay, so what is this? Twins. Exactly. The, this is twin. Is why are they like connected here? The, does this mean that they're identical, non-identical twins? What are they? What do you guys think? Identical, because they have yeah. a line. Another name for identical twins is monozygotic twins because they come from the same zygote. Okay. So monozygotic twins indicating uh, a, tw a twin pregnancy or the two diagonal lines indicates twins, okay? If it's this way, this indicates a dizygotic twin twins or in other words, non-identical twins because they come from two zygotes, two different zygotes, okay? Type, what about this? A question mark, confused. What is this? Uh, twins that are not identical? No, non-identical twins is uh, this one. There is nothing. I, if whenever you see a question mark, know that we don't know. We don't know if they're monozygotic or dizygotic. A lot of the times it doesn't truly matter. Or like maybe this detail isn't given, okay? So again, monozygotic, solid line. Dizygotic, no line. And then we're not sure, uh, we put a question mark if we're not sure. Okay, so moving on. What about the numbers that are over here? One, two, the Roman numbers. Three, what, are, what do they indicate? Generations. Exactly. And do you guys know a minimum of how many generations is required to form a proper pedigree? Three. Okay, three generations are required, okay? But, and how do you count, count uh, the number of individuals? We always start from left to right, okay? So for this is how it goes. We go one, two, three, four, okay? Also same thing, second generation starts from one, two, three, four, third, one, two. So for example, if I am talking to you, or if uh, we're taught, we're like, you're reading a question, and it says something like, oh, individual uh, three, and then, uh, where is this? Individual three, actually, let me get that one. Yeah, so individual three dash two. Then which one do I mean? It's this one. Let me give you guys an example. So let's say I have, a, oh, this is not, let's say I have, uh, a question that said something like this. Which one are we talking about? Generation two. The so square on the right. right. Exactly, individual four, okay? You see this in questions often. So you have to be able to read this. So if I say uh, like, for example, one, I'm oh, sorry, one and then two, then which one is it? You go to generation one, and then you move one, two. This is the one we're talking about, okay? But again, let's review. Um, let's review. When we have, this actually has everything we talked about. A square is a male. A circle is a female, okay? A line in between one solid line, they're married. One line, one solid line that's crossed from the middle is divorce. And the two solid lines is consanguinity or mirroring within a family, okay? So yet this line that's uh, uh, vertical shows offspring. So we know that those two had an offspring of a female and a male. And then the male got married and they got an offspring that has uh, this specific disease or like this is our patient, this is our pro, uh, okay? And then the number over here indicates the generations. 
and the number over here indicates the number of individuals. And again, we'll always start from left to right, okay? I hope this is all clear so far. Those are the basics. If you guys master the basics, you're good to go, honestly. And you're not gonna have to review this head again. Not now, not later, okay? But now let's talk about the classifications of the pattern, patterns of inheritance. This is the most important part, important part of the lecture, okay? So let's name them one by one and we'll go into more details, okay? In the upcoming slides. So we start, there's autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive, X-linked dominant, and Y-linked, okay? What's one pattern, pattern that you see common over here, okay? You can notice that three of those patterns are related to sex chromosomes, and two of them are not, okay? Autosomal meaning normal body cells, not sex cells, okay? Keep that in mind as we move forward. X-linked uh, and Y-linked, they are related, like the, uh, there are factors that relate to it, whether like a female or a male is affected and how it affects the pattern and all that. And we'll cover it one by one. But one, what I want you guys to keep in mind is that it you can notice that it's divided into two parts. Either the normal cell is affected with a mutation or an allele variant that is abnormal, or a sex cell, okay? But moving on. Okay, a character is dominant if it manifests the, it's if it manifests in the heterozygote, okay? If not, then it's what we call recessive. What does this mean? This basically simply means that if you have a gene in which one copy is mutated and the other is not, and the individual is shown in the manifestation, this means that we are dealing with a dominant trait or a dominant disease, okay? I'm reading the definition of this. And if the mutation of both copies, uh, uh, if the mutation is in both copies of the gene, then this is what we call a recessive condition, okay? So in other words, if you have something that looks like um, this. Is this writing familiar to you guys? Yeah. Is this a dominant or a recessive disease? Dominant. This is dominant. And if it's like something like this, maybe. That's recessive. It. So what do we mean by those uh, names? Okay. Whenever you see that there is uh, this kind of writing, this indicates the genes or the alleles in one gene, okay? Usually you have two alleles in each gene, one from each parent, okay? So over here, one is affected and one is not, and we call it a dominant disease or hetero, uh, hetero means different, okay? Homo means the same. So there's homozygous, heterozygous, okay? So if they're different, dominant, D, D, different, dominant. If they're the same, recessive, okay? So this is a quick example, okay? Let's say we have this gene. Those are the two alleles of this gene, okay? This is a hetero, uh, actually, before we move on to what this is, okay? Let's see how a heterozygous one would look like. Normal, and then one of them is affected, okay? Um, in the phenotype, you guys know what the difference between genotype and phenotype is, right? Actually, I'll go over it, okay? Can you go over the past two slides again? Okay. I, I can. I'll, uh, I'll finish just th uh, this part very quickly, and then everything will be clear, okay? So when we talk about uh, homozygous, heterozygous, dominant, recessive, okay? Phenotype, genotype. Actually, let's start by defining what a genotype and a phenotype is. A genotype is when we talk about something that's happening in the genes. A phenotype is how it shows, okay, in an individual, okay? So from pheno and genome. So in the genotype, if it's normal, because it's normal, okay? We have two alleles of each gene. If it's heterozygous, then one is affected and one is not. If it's homozygous, and then it's both of them, both of them are affected, okay? In the heterozygous gene, since it's dominant, then this normal allele will carry over and the individual will not show a disease. So they're healthy, they're not affected, okay? But 
If both of them are knocked out, then the individual will show a disease they're affected. I'll say this one more time. So moving, uh, I'll move back to the first two um, slides just for us to uh, recap, okay? So a quick recap is, first of all, when it comes to the patterns of inheritance, you have to keep in mind that there are two types. One of them is sex chromosome linked, and one of them is not. So autosomal dominant or recessive means that uh, this happens in normal cells. X-linked or Y-linked, this happens, a defect in some cells, okay? This is the one thing that you have to get from here. Now, we have to understand the difference between a dominant character and a recessive character, okay? So dominant is when you have, normally, a human cell, or like a human, human genes has to have two elements. If one of them affected and one of them is not, then we, this is what we call a dominant manifestation of a trait. If both of them are affected, then we call it a recessive. If it's a dominant one, one of them is normal and one of them is abnormal. Okay, this is a dominant one, for example. One of them is abnormal, one of them is normal. Because we have a normal one, then the patient will not show. Oh, sorry. Wait, did I look at something different? Oh. oh, okay. Never mind. Sorry, guys. I think I confused in this part because I didn't move uh, through the slides in chronological order. Okay, let's just look at this slide, all of us together again. Okay. So this is a normal gene. Both the genes are healthy, no no. But yeah. Let's say that we have a disease that uh, that's affecting this um uh, gene. So one of them is affected, one of them isn't, okay? But this, the phenotype of this is uh, if it's, okay, if it's a dominant disease, if it's a dominantly inherited disease, then the individual is going to be affected, okay? But if it's a recessive disease, then it's not going to show and the individual is going to be healthy. This is a bit confusing, I understand. This, do, do you guys get it or do I go over it again? So, okay, forget the slides because I think the slides are confusing with all the animations. And... Uh, yeah, yeah, it is confusing. I understand. I'm sorry, I, th I had to know when I went through the slides, I'm like, wait, can we just say this? Okay, never mind the slides. Has focus with me here, okay? Let's say we have two, two diseases, okay? Uh, let's start with disease number one, okay? Both of them are dominant diseases, okay? Both of them are autosomal dominant diseases, so yeah? Disease number one, we're talking here about disease number one. It's a dominant disease, okay? It's an autosomal dominant disease. One of them is affected and the other one is normal. Okay, yeah? The individual who carries those genes is going to show, is going to be affected, is going to show signs of the disease, okay? Because this is a dominant kind of pattern that we're following, okay? Let's move on to disease number two. The same exact thing. We have a dominant one that's affected and the other one is not affected. But this patient or this individual does not show any signs. They're healthy. This is what we call a recessive pattern of inheritance. So dominant pattern, even they have dominant pattern, they have one knocked out gene, Halas, they show the disease. Recessive pattern, they have one knocked out gene, but they don't show the disease because the other one carries over basically. Dominant, one is knocked out, disease is shown. Recessive, one is knocked out, disease is not shown. Okay? Dominant kind of inheritance, one gene is affected, the individual is affected. Recessive kind of inheritance, one gene is affected, the individual does not show any signs. The individual is healthy, although they are a carrier. This is what we call a carrier. So in recessive diseases, what we have to do is that we have to have two genes affected so that the signs of the disease can show? Exactly. And if in recessive diseases, if one like one one gene doesn't work, it won't show the marks. Meanwhile, in dominant, it might show the disease 
we might be able to receive the disease, right? Exactly, you got it, okay? okay? So in the, uh, as he said, in dominant diseases, if one is affected, disease is gonna show. If two are affected, disease is gonna show. In recessive kind of diseases, one is affected, disease is not gonna show. Two are affected, disease is gonna show. Clear? I hope this is clear. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and ask. Dominant pattern, they're dominant. So even if it affects only one class, the individual is affected. If it affects two, they're affected, I would say their bone is affected at this point, okay? Recessive disease, they're recessive. They're like kind of more peaceful. One is affected, the other one will compensate and the disease is not gonna show. Two are affected, the disease is gonna show, okay? This is a very, very important point to keep in mind. But uh, let's move on. And we can get back and like uh, do more examples uh, related to this um, uh, at the end when we do the questions, okay? Now, let's take an example about autosomal dominant diseases. Let's say we have a, uh, a mother that is normal, perfectly normal, perfectly healthy, okay? And then we have a father that is affected with a certain mutation, whatever it is, okay? Mother is normal and father is affected, so yeah? So if we do this pattern, and we take one allele from the mother that's normal, this is normal, and this is normal, okay? And the father has one affected and one that is, often one is affected, this is the small a is affected, and this is not affected, so yeah? Remember, they have an autosomal dominant, so even though they have only one that is affected, they are gonna be affected by the disease, okay? One abnormal allele is gonna make them affected with the disease, so yeah? So if we take the normal allele from the mother and the abnormal one from the father, we get one individual that's, one offspring that's affected. And then if we take the other one and this one, again, this. And like you follow the pattern. So the percent of having an affected offspring in an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance, in this case is gonna be 50%, okay? Let's say this again, because this is part of your question that you're gonna be asked about in your exam, okay? In an autosomal dominant patterns, the percent or the chance of an offspring to be affected for a normal mother and an affected father is gonna be 50%. If you are confused, always draw this table. If you are confused, always, always draw this table. Is the affected one dominant or recessive? This is dominant. This is, we consider it dominant, okay? Because also the whole pattern is dominant pattern, okay? So this patient, because, or like this offspring, they, because they care only one, and this is an autosomal uh, dominant disease, we consider them an affected patient. So those will uh, have uh, the disease. Okay, clear? By the way, it doesn't uh, matter if the mother or the father is the affected, as long as one of them is affected. So the mutation is passed by 50% of the time. Okay, any questions when it comes to this? But let's look at more features of autosomal dominant pattern, okay? So the first thing you have to know is that males and females are affected because this is autosomal uh, dominant. Regardless if it's dominant or recessive, it's autosomal, so it does not affect the sex cells. So males and females are affected equally, okay? Males and females can transmit the disease. Again, it doesn't matter if it's the mother or the father that's, that has the disease, if they have it or if they have the abnormal allele, then they're gonna pass it, okay? It's a vertical transmission. What do we mean by vertical transmission? Does anyone know? It's transmitted to the next generation. Exactly, exactly. That very simply put, this is it. Transmitted to the next generation, okay? And then the last thing is that a child of an affected parent has a 50% risk of being affected. This summarizes it. This is what you guys have to know in summary about autosomal dominant diseases, okay? But before moving on to how the pattern looks like in autosomal uh, recessive, any questions? 
Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, so please. how do we know if it's a dominant or not? It, okay, we'll get to that in a bit, but very good thinking. Generally, what you uh, can keep in mind, and it depends on, on the disease, okay? Depends on the um, nature of the disease and like what uh, genes it's affecting specifically, but we'll get to that in later slides, okay? All right. Okay. Okay. So moving on to autosomal recessive kind of inheritance. So again, to recap, recessive, if one allele is affected, the individual is gonna be healthy. If both of them are knocked out, then the individual is gonna be affected, okay? But also one more thing to remember is that when you have double lines over here, this indicates consanguinity. And consanguinity is the number or like one of the leading causes of autosomal recessive diseases. When you guys do the pediatrics rotation, inshallah, Everything is gonna be autosomal recessive because of consanguinity. Okay. But anyway, let's see what are the yeah autosomal recessive diseases. What are the facts that you have to keep in mind about this pattern? Exactly. First thing is increased incidence of consanguinity, and then males and females again are affected because again this is an autosomal disease. It's not related to sex chromosomes. Recurrence rate risk at this uh, is twenty five percent in each pregnancy. And parents of the affected children are asymptomatic carriers, okay? So this is where the concept of carriers come. Carriers means that they have one affected gene and one gene that's not affected and they do not show the disease. They themselves do not show, they do not have the disease, but they can pass it because they're carriers, okay? Let's look at the, uh, the pattern with autosomal recessive. Let's say we have a mother that's a carrier and a father that's a carrier. So A capital A small, A capital B small. So yeah, let's do the thing. They have, they can have one normal offspring, two carriers, and one affected. Okay, because that this is not affected, not affected. So we get a non-affected, completely normal offspring. And then if we do, uh, this one is an, an affected allele, and this one is a not affected. So you get a carrier. Same thing over here, and only when you get two copies of an abnormal allele, that's when you have an affected child. So in this case, in an autosomal recessive, you get a 25% chance of having infected offsprings. Let's read it again. Risk of recurrence is 25% in each pregnancy. In autosomal dominant, if we have, want to have a look at it again, it was a 50% chance. Why? Because if you have one that's one allele that's affected, خلاص, the the uh, offspring already has or like will develop the um, uh, disease. Uh, in the previous diagram, why don't they have dots in the middle if they are carriers? See, um, honestly, this is one question I had in mind before as well when I was studying this. But what I understood is that this is not strictly followed whether they're carriers or not. Uh, it's not strictly, it's strictly follow, followed to add the dot in the middle. This is one of the exceptions or the kind of weird rules about pedigrees. This dot in the middle is not put unless it signifies something important. Or sometimes it's not used at all. This is from my own observation, honestly. Okay. Fine. Right. So this is when it comes to autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive diseases. You see those boxes, the yellow and green boxes in both the patterns of inheritance. If you guys have them memorized and understood, you're done, honestly. But what is this, hello? Uh, I think this is an example. Uh, one second. Yeah, oh, yeah, this is another example of a... Okay, this is important. I'm moving on. See, this is um, one that shows in all. Those are carriers, those are not carriers, okay? So let's talk about X-linked recessive diseases, okay? Well, the first thing that you have to remember about this is that only males are affected with X-linked recessive diseases, okay? And females are always carriers. Why is that? 
remember, that males have only one X chromosome. So if it's affected, that's it. There is no other X chromosome that is going to uh, show healthy uh, features or carry on the healthy or like basically cover the disease, okay? Because with females, they have two Xs. So if they have one abnormal X, then they have another normal X that can compensate for it. And remember, this is a recessive. So it will only show in females if both of them are affected. So if you have an affected mother or a carrier mother and an affected dad, and you get the mutated or the abnormal allele from both of them, that's only when a female is affected, okay? Is this clear? So what you have to remember over here that males uh, are mostly affected with autosomal uh, with X-linked recessive diseases, who females are carriers, okay? For the carrier mothers, there is a 50% chance of having carrier daughters, okay? And there's a 50% chance of, of having affected sons, okay? We'll see how. And of course, there's no male-to-male -male tra transmission because like, if a male has one normal allele false, it's, it's the same one is gonna pass. One normal X, yes. If you have an affected male though, all daughters will be carriers, okay? And all sons are gonna be normal or not? Affected? Okay. No, they're going to be normal. We're going to draw the box and look at it one by one. Let me just, okay. So just let's look at the facts about this first. So first thing, there is no male-to-male -male transmission, as we mentioned. And then the next thing is that it affects mainly males. Okay, you can have affected females, but it's less likely, okay? And then the next thing is that the mother is usually an asymptomatic carrier because as we mentioned, mostly males are affected and mostly females are carriers. And then the last thing is carrier mothers may have affected male relatives. I mean, this is a very minor fact, honestly. So for an affected male, all sons were, will be normal. Why? Because a um, son is gonna take the white chromosome from his dad, and this is an X link. So how they're not going to get the affected X. So they're good, okay? And all daughters would be carriers. If the mother is a carrier, then she, if she gets the affected one, actually, no, never mind. All daughters will be carrier because they get one X from their dad and one X from their mom. And if the X of the dad is affected, then they get it and they become a carrier. I think it's uh, easier when we look at this, but let's say with that we have a normal mother and an affected father, okay? So this is what's gonna be, like, what it's gonna look like. So XX, both of them are normal. This is an affected X and this is a normal X, okay? So for an affected father, okay, uh, all sons will be, will be normal because the son gets the Y. This X. this X has nothing to do with anything when it comes to the son. Okay, and the mother is normal. So normal and normal, why? False, they're normal. When it comes to the daughters, on the other hand, they will take the X. Regardless of the mother's X, they're gonna have at least one affected X, okay? Which makes them carriers. Does the disease show on them? Well, no. If they're carriers, it doesn't, but they can inherit it, yeah. Exactly. Let's say we have a mother that's a carrier and a father that's normal. Okay. So again, the XY is normal and the XX, we have one X that's affected. Okay. For the sons first, there's a 50% chance of them being affected. Because again, the sons get the Y from the dad. The Y is perfectly normal, no problem. Okay, and the dad is normal. Okay. And then for the mother, there's a 50% chance that they get the normal X. And there is a 50% chance that they get the mutated or the abnormal X. So overall, there is a 50% chance that they are affected. Okay. So what about the, the daughters? Uh, again, 
it's a 50-50% chance they get a normal X from their dad and there's a 50% chance that they get the other X from their mother. Either it's gonna be abnormal or normal, okay? So 50% chance that this is, a, a, that the, the sons are affected and 50% chance that the um, daughters are carriers. But yeah. Uh, is this clear? If you understand this, then everything that's coming ahead of you is easy. Is the capital A and small a carrier or affected? Um, a, A, you mean the autosomal dominant and recessive? If that's what you mean, it depends if it's a carrier, if it depends if it's a dominant disease or a recessive disease. If it's a recessive disease, then no, they're not affected. You have to have both of them to be knocked out, knocked out genes for the individual to be affected. Because if it's a dominant disease, then yes, the individual will be affected. We'll go over all the patterns one more time, okay? Uh, after we're done with them, because we only have one more pattern to go. One more little, I think. Okay, so uh, let's talk about X inactivation. When it comes to males, they always have their X active. What does this mean? They only have one X, so it will be active regardless, okay? When it comes to females, they can have one inactive X in each cell, okay? So one of them is gonna be working and the other won't be. Why is this an important fact to keep in mind? This is important when we talk about carriers, okay? Because in carriers, we have one that's affected and one that's not. But the patient or the individual still does not show the disease. They're only a carrier. Why is that? Because one of them is inactive and the other is active, okay? Because when it comes to the males, it, the X is always active because it's the only one that they have, okay? This is the concept beha be behind the X uh, inactivation, okay? What do we mean by skewed X inactivation? When the del uh, deleterious allele is located in the active X, the normal allele is in the inactive text, text te X, manifesting a heterozygous. This means that if I have a mutation that's manifesting a heterozygous, then it's dominant. So a skewed X, I think explaining it over here is gonna confuse you guys. So if you guys don't get it over here, then don't worry about it because Marian is gonna talk about it in the next uh, uh, half of the lecture. So I believe let's just focus on the patterns of inheritance here and the most important key points that we have to keep in mind about each. And we can keep this for another layer later, okay? As long as you get the X in activation, this is gonna be covered again uh, with Marian, okay? So we talked about this and then now we're okay. Now let's talk about the X-linked dominant. So remember the one that we talked about uh, previously is the X-linked recessive, but yeah. When it comes to the X-linked dominant, it's a very similar resemblance to autosomal dominant diseases, okay? This is the first. The second point, again, there is no male to male transmission because it's X-linked, same uh, concept as last time. Okay. And the next thing that males and females are affected, but females are more prone to be affected. Again, same reason because it's X-linked, okay? And then uh, let's talk about this in actually the over here, okay. Let's say we have a normal mother, but yeah, and an affected father. So let's look at this again. A normal and a normal. And then here, this one is affected and this one is normal. For this son, okay, uh, for the son of an affected male, okay? All sons will be normal. Again, because the son takes the Y, the Y is normal. They have nothing to do with this mutated X. Sons are okay, okay? When it comes to the daughters, on the other hand, all of them will be affected, okay? From the name, 
it's dominant. So even if you have only one that's affected, the individual is affected. If you have one abnormal allele, خلاص, there's no such thing as carrier over here because it's dominant. It's a dominant disease, okay? It's a very assertive disease. Okay? So when it comes to over here, uh, the daughter is definitely going to get one X from their father and one X from their mother. And the X from the father is affected, but all daughters are going to be affected if the father is affected. So yeah, let's look at the next example. If we have a mother that's affected and a father that's not. So yeah. So when it comes to the son, first, they get the Y from their dad, no problem with the Y. And then the X from their mother, one X is uh, affected, one is not. So this gives them a 50% chance to be affected. Same thing for the daughter. They're gonna get the normal X from their dad and they have a 50% chance of getting either the abnormal X or the normal X. So this leaves them with a 50% chance of development. So regardless, son or daughter, 50% chance of development. So yeah. Uh, moving on. Let's talk about white linked inheritance. From the name, only males are affected because females do not have Y chromosomes, right? And all sons are affected and to males that are affected. Let's look at this over here. So, yeah. Y is given to a male and it's, it's you can think of it as only dominant, honestly, because like there is no X, Y, Y, or there's no Y, Y. It's only X, Y. This is affected, this is knocked out, this is abnormal, plus the son is affected, okay? And for those, uh, it's unfortunate that for those fathers, the sons will always be affected and the daughters will always be normal. Why? Because it's Y, y linked. So there's no, there's no Y chromosome for it, okay? Okay, so we're almost done. Um, so there's this one last thing about uh, Mendel's law of inheritance, Tayyip. And he's like uh, the first, pre honestly, oh, this is a bit of history. It's not very important about anything. I stick through it. It's, I'm not going to go through it, not confusing this. But this is pretty much it for everything. Okay. I want to go to just one slide and uh, summarize what we talked about. Okay. So the shapes are easy, inshallah. Um, this one. Okay. So when it comes to uh, the patterns of inheritance, we talked about five. Oh, yeah. Those five patterns are the autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, the autosomal dominant, the autosomal recessive, X-linked dominant, X-linked recessive, Y-linked. In this summary, what you have to keep in mind, when we say autosomal, this means normal cells and not um, sex chromosomes, okay, or related cells, okay? So if you guys are confused with any point that we discussed throughout the lecture, this, just listen to those two minutes that I'm going to talk because it will summarize everything, okay? So yeah, this is related to sex chromosomes. This is related to non-sex chromosomes. So, yeah. When we say dominant, this means if we have one affected allele, then the individual is affected. When we have two affected alleles, it's also affected. So, yeah. When it comes to autosomal recessive, if one affected allele, we call them a carrier and they do not show the disease, but they can inherit it to their offspring. Okay. If they have two affected, then they they are affected. If they have two abnormal alleles, then they're an affected individual, okay? And of course, they can inherit it as well, but yeah. So those are the two things that you have to keep in mind when it comes to name, but yeah. Whenever you're confused, oh, which one has more? Was it 25 or 50% or whatever it is? Draw this, just draw this thing, but yeah. Let's talk about autosomal recessive. You have an affected mother, like one parent that's affected and one that is normal. It does not matter if the parent, the mother is affected or the father is normal. In autosomal patterns, recessive or dominant, it doesn't matter if the mother or father is affected, okay? 
المهم one of them is affected طيب there is a 50% chance of the offsprings to be uh, affected with the disease again we don't talk about mean females males son daughters in autosomal dominant or recessive diseases okay we only talk about them in x linked or y linked طيب yep. so in autosomal dominant there are four things that you have to keep in mind males and females are affected طيب yep. Males and females can transmit disease. It does not matter whether it's the mother or father that's affected. Vertical transmission, as in it comes within each generation, and a child is of an affected parent has a 50% chance, chance of being affected. If you are confused or not sure, draw this. One affected, one not affected, crisscross and match, and you get it, okay? With dominant, if you have one of them that's abnormal, follows the individual is affected. Okay, this is autosomal dog. Okay. Let's talk about autosomal recessive. Autosomal recessive, oh my. autosomal recessive, no male to male transmission. Oh, la, this is not autosomal. Oh, this is excellent. Uh, sorry, sorry. So, we talked about autosomal dominant. Now, autosomal recessive, four facts that you have to keep in mind. That it's increased with consanguinity. Second thing, both males and females are affected, again, regardless, okay? Because it's autosomal, it doesn't matter, male, female, okay? Recurrence risk at this is 25% within each pregnancy, and parents of affected children are asymptomatic carriers. Again, you draw this again. Because it's recessive, you know that, uh, uh, one affected allele is going to give a carrier. Two affected alleles are going to get an affected or diseased individual. And no effect, normal. So 25% chance. If both of them are carriers, the one this is the case. So anyway, you're confused. You draw this, you get your answer. But yeah, this is for autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. Any questions? I'll take that other one. But let's see X-linked. X-linked, first of all. No male to male transmission because it's X. Remember, females XX, so it's related to females more. And there is no male to male transmissions because the sons get the Y chromosome from their dads. Okay? Uh, affects mainly males. The mother is usually an asymptomatic carrier. The carrier mothers may be affected male relatives. This is just like one more fact to keep in mind. And how do you know 50% or whatever? You look over here. A mother is normal. You have two, two scenarios. A mother is normal, a father is affected. So yeah, you look over here. The sons are gonna be normal. The daughters are gonna be carriers. Okay, two reasons we already went through. Sons get the Y and the X's are normal, both of them. So the sons are okay. The daughters, there's one affected uh, X that they're gonna uh, like forcefully take from their dad. So they're going to be carriers. They're not going to show the disease, but they can uh, give it to their offspring. Or if we have a mother that's a carrier and a father that's normal, then there is a 50% chance of getting a normal kid. Uh, um, what is it called? Um, either son or daughter, so male or female. And you can get 25% chance of a carrier and one that's a How can I answer the question? How are males affected in X dominant? How are males affected in X dominant? We'll get to X dominant right now. So X recessive, uh, I hope it's clear. X dominant, I think, was the one before it. No, this is autism recessive. Okay, over here. So X linked dominant. Dominant, again, you have one allele that's affected, then false, that's it. So it's very uh, close to the resemblance of autosomal dominant, no male to male transmission, again. Males and females are affected, but females more than males. And then you draw this to get to know the um, percentages or patterns. Mother, that's normal, father, that's affected. The, the son is gonna be normal again because they get the Y and the Y over here is not affected because this is an X-linked uh, disorder. Yeah. 
the mother is gonna uh, and he uh, the daughters are gonna be affected definitely because they're gonna have forcefully one gene that one uh, x that's defected from their dad okay the x from their mother is okay so they're gonna be affected one normal one abnormal and it's dominant but if you have a mother that's affected and a father that's normal but this answers the question that was asked and how are males affected in x-linked dominant diseases right? Hello, 